does self-criticism help you become the person you want to be or does it help you achieve your goals? It's a pretty tricky subject and I think a lot of people have different views on it. I want to watch this clip between Lex and Jocko Willink when he's talking about being self-critical and how um, he uses that to help motivate him and to, in his opinion, achieve and then afterwards, I'm going to break down some different perspectives on how self-criticism impacts our emotions, our moods, our motivation. And I'll give you my two cents and what some of the research shows. So I'm going to roll it and then I will be back. Best Googlers. The, the funny thing about Jamie, this is OK. You might, you might not like this, but what I what I like, I'm constantly exceptionally self-critical to a point of like, self-hating sometimes. I deeply appreciate every single moment I'm alive, but everything I've ever done, I feel like is shit. <laughs> and when I talk to Jamie about everything he's done, he's so just in every way he carries himself, he's so self-critical. He's so like worried that it's wrong, it's bad. That anxious energy, I love it. <laughs> Cause that, that's how you lead to growth and progress. Like you might like uh, a therapist might say, that's probably not good for your like well-being. Fuck it. It's good for the, what's good for your well being is to create awesome things. That's ultimately what leads to happiness, is to, to create the best thing you can in your life. And uh, so when I see that in, in, in somebody like Jamie or anybody I talk to, when you're really self critical, that's a good sign to me. I, is that ridiculous? <laughs> I just want to pause it there. Lex mentions that. If you were a therapist, you might not say that's so healthy. And then he says, oh, fuck it. And I'm a therapist. I'm also someone who works on my own mental health, my own self-critical thoughts and, and way of relating to myself. So I think the first thing I would say is it really depends. It depends on you. It depends on if your self-criticism is done in such a way that it is kind, lighthearted, and encouraging in some sense. I think, I don't know, Lex, but the sense that he has here as he's describing this is one that is a little more lighthearted and motivating. A lot of people, unfortunately, don't have that lightheartedness when they're self-critical. A lot of people's self-criticism leads them to really dark places, and it does not lead them to accomplishing the task or pursuing the goal or doing whatever it is they're wanting to do. It generally has a, quite the opposite effect. Another thing he said that is that happiness or well-being comes from the pursuit or the endeavor to do great things or to achieve goals and so on and so forth. Now, I think that a lot of that is true. I think we do achieve well-being or we experience happiness and we experience positive emotion in the pursuit of goals and the pursuit of activities we find meaningful. If you're on YouTube and you're following all those conversations, I'm sure you've heard Jordan Peterson talk a lot about that. So we're not going to go down there, but I do think uh, it's important to acknowledge that that is true. Although um, there's a diminishing return on the type of motivation and self-criticism that we use in order to pursue our goals. So I think it's important to balance that if self-criticism works for you and you can do it in a lighthearted way where it is actually somewhat humorous or somewhat kind in some sense, then I think that's okay. But I'd say most people, that's not their experience. So I would be careful with that. Okay, I'm going to roll it and we'll listen to a bit more. Ridiculous at all. And it goes back, you know, you were, you were, the way you were phrasing these questions about what makes a good person and what makes a good leader, the way you phrase them kind of eliminated the normal answer that I give. The normal answer that I give, you ask me what makes a good leader, what makes a good person, is is being humble. So when you're going to hire someone for your for your startup or whatever company you're creating, that is a key characteristic to look for, 
is someone that has the humility, like humility. like young Jamie, to say, yeah, you know, I, I could have done this better and here's what I can improve and here's what I need to work on. When you have somebody that thinks they know everything, um, out of the gate, you're you're already got someone that's going to be hard to deal with. They're going to be hard to coach. They're going to be hard to mentor. When you have somebody that's truly humble, you barely, again, it's minimum force required because when you say to Jamie after a show, how do you think that went? He says, well, you know, I did this wrong and I didn't have this set up in time. And you don't, you don't barely have to do anything because he's got the humility. If you've got someone that's a big ego and you say, hey, how did that show go? He goes, I went awesome on my end. Now, guess what you have to do? Now you have to start applying force as a leader, which is expending leadership capital, which we don't want to do because we always try and conserve our leadership capital as much as we possibly can. And when we have to expend it just to get Jamie to make some improvements, that's bad. Mm -hmm. So when you go looking for people, look for people that are humble. Now, does this mean you look for people that don't have any confidence? No, that's not what I'm saying. There's a balance to all these things. That's the dichotomy of leadership. You, But people tend towards... And look, I work with a lot of military troops in the past. Now I work with companies. The reason I talk about humility all the time is because for someone to be get into a leadership position in the military, they have to have confidence. So the tendency is that their confidence is going to outweigh their humility at some point. Mm -hmm. Same thing with, with civilian companies. If you get to a point of leadership inside of a company, you have to have confidence to get there. You don't get to a position of leadership inside of a company lacking confidence. So the tendency is for confidence to, to grow a little bit too much. And we have to put that, put that confidence into check. We have to put that ego into check. Really good leaders, they're confident, but they're humble. That's the balance of the dichotomy. Amazing answer. I, Jocko is a wise man. The first thing I think he pinpointed which is something i was trying to talk about before is that there's a difference and this i would contrast this to what lex was saying there's just a difference to having the self-awareness and the humility to notice where you can improve what are some things that you did not do as well as you would have liked to versus chastising yourself and berating yourself for making mistakes. And Jocko worded it really well there. So it is a balance of self-awareness, humility, and the definition of humility I like is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Take that for what you will. Here we are, we have this balance of humility and confidence. And the more I think about this in real time, I love that humility piece to the self awareness or the ability to self reflect on the things that you can improve without berating yourself. Because when we berate ourselves, that has a host of negative emotional responses that demotivate us. Or you might get a short boost of motivation, but in the long term, there's diminishing returns on that self criticism. So I encourage you in your self criticism to practice some humility, to do it in an encouraging manner. And that's generally a good way to go. I will now read a little bit of the research on this and how it how that actually works, okay? Okay, we are going to read from the Mindful Self-Compassion Workbook here, and this is from Kristen Neff and Chris Germer, wonderful researchers and teachers, and the self-compassion practices are incredibly helpful for well-being and for dealing with uh, situations such as self-criticism. According to Paul Gilbert, who created Compassion Focused Therapy, CFD, when we criticize ourselves, we're tapping into the body's threat defense system, sometimes referred to as our reptilian brain. Among the many ways we can react to perceived danger, the threat defense system is the quickest and most easily triggered. This means that self-criticism is often our first reaction when things go wrong. The threat defense system evolved so that when we perceive a threat, our amygdala, which registers danger in the brain, that's actually not totally accurate. It, re it registers threat detection and then how we in 
interpret threat detection is either interpreted as danger or as something else. Okay, it gets activated. We release cortisol and adrenaline, and we get ready to fight, flee, or freeze. The system works well for protecting against threats to our physical bodies, but nowadays, most of the threats we face are challenges to our self-image or self-concept. Feeling threatened puts stress on the mind and body, and chronic stress can cause anxiety, depression, anxiety and depression, which is why habit, habitual self-criticism is so bad for emotional and physical well-being. With self-criticism, we are both the attacker and the attacked. I absolutely love that, that image or metaphor. When I work with kids often, I will, I will say, when you're being mean to yourself and shitting on yourself, you're the bully and the one being bullied. And you can just imagine how much that impacts you negatively. I just love that point. So when we feel inadequate, our self-concept is threatened. So we attack the problem ourselves. We're both the attacker and the attacked. Okay, I go on. Luckily, we're not just reptiles, but also mammals. The evolutionary advance of mammals is that mammalian young are born very immature and have a longer developmental period to adapt to their environment. To keep infants safe during this vulnerable period, the mammalian care system evolved, prompting parents and offspring to stay close. When the care system is activated, oxytocin, the love hormone, and endorphins Natural feel-good opiates are released, which helps reduce stress and increase feelings of safety and security. Two reliable ways of activating the care system are soothing touch and gentle vocalizations. Think of a cat purring and licking her kittens. Compassion, including self-compassion, is linked to the mammalian care system. That's why being compassionate to ourselves when we feel inadequate makes us feel safe and, care and cared for like a child held in a warm embrace. Self-compassion helps to down-regulate the threat response. When the stress response, fight, flight, freeze, is triggered by a threat to our self-concept, we are likely to turn on ourselves in an unholy trinity of reactions. We fight ourselves, self-criticism, we flee from others, isolation, or we freeze, rumination. These three reactions are precisely the opposite of the three components of self-compassion, self-kindness, common humanity, and mindfulness. I love the self-compassion practices. They're incredibly helpful. I encourage you to check them out. I will continue to speak about them. And... If you feel so obliged, comment on this video. We are now in the midst of our eight-week self-compassion uh, meditation group. Week three is coming up. Anyway, leave a comment. Say, I want to join the self-compassion meditation group, and I will send you the details for that. Anyhow, um, I don't know if Lex, going back to the video here, I don't know if Lex practices self-compassion or not. What I would encourage him to do is to reflect on whether his self-criticism is done in a compassionate manner. Is it done in some form of ego, threat, defensiveness, self-centeredness, where he really overinflates his sense of self and who he is and his importance? And, and I don't mean that personally, that's his ego going and how he relates to that. And if in his current life that is helping him achieve his goals and do the amazing things that he does because he's an incredible human being. His podcast is incredible. The work he does in AI is also incredible. But uh, when I was listening to this conversation, I couldn't help myself pony up my unsolicited reflection feedback, and so on and so forth. So I hope you found that helpful. Please comment, please like, please subscribe, please share this. And um, 
If you've lasted this long, well, my name is Mike Stroh. I am a psychotherapist and I'm also the founder of Starts With Me. It's a consultancy that specializes in K-12 education and workplace mental health. I hope you keep watching. I hope you engage with me and I wish you all the best. Take it easy. Peace out.